Okay, it looks like we are live. So I'm going to add a comment. Hooray. <laughs> and it says failed to post a comment. That, that's good. That's really good. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Anyway, so I want to provide some really good backstory as we like start. Melissa and I were having a really good like 20 minute conversation before this, um, just about like what we're struggling with currently. And frankly, you know, it ended up going into the generational trauma that both of us have experienced um, with our families and how that's impacted us and how we've like ended up where we are. And I think it's really interesting. We had so much that we could relate to with each other. Um, and I think that's like where we're going to get started. Just like a really tangible, open um, discussion around like our backstories, how we got into tech and like maybe touching on that trauma a little bit, like in, you know, however we feel comfortable. So Melissa, do you want to start? Just like with an introduction, like how you got to where you are um, and sharing as much or as little as you like. Of course. Thanks, Francis. So my name is Melissa. I am a software engineer at Adobe. And how that ended up happening, I, I did not study computer science. I did not even think I would be a software engineer ever. Um, I ended up doing a coding bootcamp. Uh, this was called uh, Galvanize. It was a six-month full-stack coding bootcamp. That was sponsored by the Adobe, Adobe Digital Academy, <laughs> Adobe, um, <laughs> and it was triggered by uh, actually a family emergency. So around the time I had been working at Facebook as a content moderator, and I went to visit my family in Argentina. And when I went to see my dad, he was not behaving in a way that was congruent with his personality, and that's when we realized something was wrong and we needed to bring him back to the United States to, to look after him and take care of his needs. And long story short, turned out to be early onset dementia. And this kind of triggered my whole career transition because, you know, being in the Bay Area, being in California, um, you need to make a lot of money to be able to take care of other people. And the, source, uh, the resources for taking care of older people is very limited especially if they haven't hit retirement age. So my dad was like, I think 59, 60 at that time. So a lot of the low income housing was kind of unavailable to him. And yeah, that's kind of how that happened. Um, I was sharing with Francis before we went live that, um, you know, I come from a Korean family, a lot of stoicness, not a lot of emotional like love and support. And during the time when my dad had, you know, so, like had dementia, he was actually a lot more like physically like affectionate. Um, so I have a lot of fun memories during that time of struggle. Um, and, you know, like sometimes life kicks you forward, <laughs> even though you feel like it's kicking you down. <laughs> yeah, Francis, I think, do you wanna go? yeah, yeah, no, but I think like to add there, what what is really nice is that you found this opportunity to just keep going forward even in a time of like kind of darkness right and i think for me like that just shows kind of the grit that you personally had to continue to persevere even when there was so much going on like at that time um and i i will touch on like what we were talking about too like with the generational trauma so i think this is really similar to like your story and a lot of stories like like ours where we're either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And both of my parents immigrated from Peru when they were pretty young. They both grew up in poverty, like really poor. Um, my dad, he uh, was the oldest of 10 kids and he um, didn't have a father figure. His uh, dad was pretty absent. Um, had just kind of some some abuse in there as well like physical abuse from his absent father uh and growing up uh didn't really give too much physical affection like kind of similar to to your to your dad and i i got a lot of affection for my mom and other other people in my life but that was definitely something like i always wanted to make my dad really proud of me 
um, because I just never really knew if he was, you know, and he, he always was. Mm. And that, that's the thing, like I'm learning now in my life as I'm older and we have a, like just a more sort of grounded relationship that, uh, he very much was like the cause of me going into technology. You know, he was the one, uh, who gave me this computer game when I was younger to learn math and science. Uh, he, came to this country on a scholarship because he he knew math really well like that's how he got out of poverty is he was very good at math basically and that, right now he's um he's a college professor for MBA students at at Hampton University which is where I got my undergrad um and he continues to do that to this day um but yeah he really is kind of the reason I even like got into STEM in the first place like before I learned about tech I was really into medicine and at each stage in like my career, I can point out like him sort of pushing me and being like, hey, maybe this is something you can do. And also you, you can just do whatever you want. You know, you can there are no limits, basically. And that's something that he inherently put into me. Right. So even though he didn't provide like that emotional affection that I really wanted, um, he did provide sort of this, I would say, ambition, this like hardworking mentality that I still have to this day. And that has greatly benefited me. So I think like, for me, I took a more like, I think, privileged sort of traditional route into tech. I did the computer science degree. And again, that was because that was because of him. Like I, I wouldn't have really explored it unless he said like, hey, there's this thing co like called coding boot camps. I read an article about it in the New York Times, you should look into this. And I was like, what? I don't know what this is about. Sorry, that was my dog. Um, so yeah, I, I owe a lot to him. And I think like, I, I, I think people can relate to sort of just like having um, maybe like a, a tougher relationship with family members, but still recognizing that there are those silver linings from those relationships, whether you realize it like at the moment or much, much later on in life, like how they actually impacted you and, and your and your journey. So, yeah, I think we started out really heavy, um, but <laughs> I I think you know we're just trying to both be like real about where where we came from. So yeah, um, do we want to talk more about like kind of what the different experiences have been like at our different parts of our career, sort of like versus when we first started out. Now we're kind of like more into it. Now we've been in the industry for a couple of years. Do you want to start off like with how you were feeling when you first started off, Melissa? Yeah, sure. Uh, just to let you know, it sounds like your audio wasn't great. Uh, someone commented. Oh, um, okay. Let me check. There might have been a little bit of a buffering issue, but hopefully on the replay, everyone can hear everything clearly. Oh, okay. Yeah. We are recording too. So that's good. Um, I will put my mic closer to me, <laughs> um, but yeah, go ahead. So for me, um, I kind of split up my career till now, uh, in three stages. So going through the coding bootcamp and, you know, also juggling my family situation with my dad, um, I was feeling very confident. I was like, it's either I succeed or I succeed later. So for me, when I was going through like learning how to code and getting interested in it and applying to boot camps, I was like, I'm going to get somewhere. I'm going to do something and I'm going to get a job doing this. And that was really funny because when I started my first internship, I was like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I feel like overwhelmed. Um, but for like a really key skill is building uh, bridges. It's building a safety net, is uh, building those relationships around you so that you feel safe. And that came in very handy for me during this first stage of my career where I'm getting my feet wet, seeing if this is for me. Um, then came that middle piece where, you know, like my dad had passed away mm -hmm. and he was such a big why for me that at that point I was like, why am I in this career if not for him? Like he's not here anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a big turning point for me because I was trying to figure out, do I value being in this career track? Um, because for me, money has never been like the primary motivator. Uh, it has always been, how can I help people? How can I make the world better? And 
that was really interesting. So the middle period of my career, like a few years ago, was all about imposter syndrome. <laughs> like, is this right for me? And then after I moved through that, um, I am now going again into this growing confidence because I value the what we bring to the space. Like, like what we're doing right now is inspiring others to enter tech, mm -hmm. especially women, especially Latinas. Mm -hmm. And I am growing in confidence again in my career and I'm finding ways to advocate for myself and also uh, see a future. I don't know if I want to go into management or to continue on the IC route, mm -hmm. but uh, either way, I feel like more stabilized again. So if anybody out there is feeling like they're questioning their career in tech, it's completely normal. Uh, just find mentors, find allies to talk things through. Um, and yes. Yeah. Do what's best for you. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think also for folks who are just like trying to get started or transition, I think getting the first role is the hardest part. I think after you do that, it becomes so much easier to either transition internally at the company or just leave, you know, if you're not really feeling it after one year or four years or what have you and get move on. And uh, I think it's like very clear that within our industry, at least, it's just easier to get promoted, unfortunately, if you do leave and like go somewhere else. But there's also a lot of benefit to staying at the same place, building those relationships and just like kind of learning as much as you can. So for me, mm -hmm. I've only had like three full time jobs um, at, at three companies. And this role that I have now at Byteboard is my first startup. And that was like something intentionally where I really wanted to challenge myself because uh, historically I had just been at two really, really big companies. Um, and for me, I didn't feel imposter syndrome until I started job searching for my second job. So before I got my job at Slack, uh, I was getting waitlisted uh, not waitlisted, sorry, that's college. I was getting to the point where you like interview and <laughs> you are at the final round, but you don't get it. So kind of like college, but mm. like not really. Um, and that kept happening to me like a lot. And so I really felt like, am I not in like, uh, am I applying to like too difficult of a position? You know, should I try something like more like easy? Um, so I even started going for developer advocate roles and, you know, to all the developer advocates out there, have so much respect for you all. And how I saw it at the time is that developer advocacy is historically a lower paid role than software engineering. And I thought it would be easier to get uh, access into that role than into um, software engineering. Although I, I really do love DevRel actually. And I've tried to pursue that before. Um, so I, yeah, I tried to do that. It still didn't work out. And then I was uh, calling my mom, like one of those days when I was job searching and I, I was asking her like, you know, I'm really struggling. I don't know what to do. And she kind of just gave pretty generic advice, like just keep trying. You can do it. I believe in you. But that was enough. You know, that was enough for me to keep going. And about a month later, I landed the role at Slack finally. And my first role I won't dig into that, but it was pretty toxic and I really wanted to leave. So that was like all the more reason to like try and find a role and like how I it was kind of like out of a place of desperation. But I will say, like, even with my first job search, it was so tough. I feel like I had to settle and like use that first job as like a stepping stone to get to a better job. And that's okay too, as long as you are very self-aware about how long you want to stay there, what you want to get out of the job, and then moving on. Um, but yeah, I will say like the first one's super tough, but now as you get more and more experience, you get more privilege too. And like who you can, who you're willing to even accept a call with if you're job searching or who you're willing, uh, how much time you're willing to like put um, into the job search as well, because so many companies want senior level engineers or engineers with just more experience, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And also that whole thing about your first role being toxic. Uh, I just hope that there are people out there that if you're currently in a toxic environment, it's not about your inability to cope. It's not about your inability to succeed. It's about the environment that you're in. 
So like, don't judge yourself based on that and go and find greener pastures. Uh, because a lot of people just quit the industry altogether when they get into situations like that. So I'm very, very glad you did in Francis because you're amazing. Uh, and yeah, we're, we get to have all of these gems from you, including your newsletter and all of your blogs and your mentorship. So very glad that you didn't let that bring you down. Thank you. I appreciate that. And that, actually that does remind me too, like, I'm not at that point yet, but I know a lot of friends who are working moms, right? And because of COVID, they couldn't find childcare and they had to take a break. And then that impacts their like career trajectory. And like, as a woman, I am always so worried about that, like in the back of my mind, because I do want to have a family one day, but it's like, I know that's going to impact my career trajectory. So I have to think about, okay, do I get to this position so that it feels more secure before I decide to have a family? Like I have to think about those things. And mm -hmm. that again is like a privilege that people who are not in my position, like as a woman, I guess, um, don't have to think about. So um, there are so many sort of different like things in life that are also just going to change your career trajectory, right? At different points in your career. Like it could be a family thing. It could be you wanting to start a family. It could be, you know, a health reason. And I think those are all things to think about too um, as you're thinking about like how you want your career to look as well. Like there are things you can't control basically. That's so yeah. true. I had the same, same exact fear recently because while well, I'm engaged, we just bought a home. Mm -hmm. And the next step for me is, you know, getting married and having kids. And that's my fear is, have I not advanced enough in my career to, to have that stability, to, to go for a long, go away to have my kids and then come back and be able to continue growing that career, even though there was a gap. Um, and I'm also stressed out about the notion of like childcare on top of work. Right. And I'm just like, how do most of these women do it? Because traditionally our society uh, kind of, leans more on women to take care of the kids and it's wild you know yeah <laughs> the, the long the, the more i age and grow and look around i'm like hmm, how have we as a society uh actually managed to you know do as well as we're doing now <laughs> right and there's I so think, much more yeah. we could be doing yeah and i think like there it goes again with like the privilege of just having more experience because then you can probably find a company who has like better work flexibility and they're more willing to hire you because you have more experience. You just like have more choice in the company you work for when you have more experience. And that's like what's so mm -hmm. unfortunate is that I think early on in your career, you do kind of have to, you feel like this obligation to grind a bit and like really hustle to sort of prove your worth. And you cannot do that if you have a bunch of other things going on in your personal life. Like I was, I completely embraced that mentality of like, I'm just going to code at my desk like all day. I have no work-life balance. I'm a workaholic. I'm single. Like I was single. Um, and just like putting all of my energy into my job, you know, and a lot of young people can do that, but it's not sustainable. And it's not something that and really anyone should want to do long-term, I think. Um, and as a woman, I don't have that choice. Like, I can't keep doing that, like, long term. It's just not an option for me. So thinking about that, too, like, it is in the back of my mind how I want to advance and how important it is for me to advance because of those things, actually. They have a correlation with each other. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, things are, we've been <laughs> discussing some really heavy things. I'm actually really happy about that. I feel like these things aren't really discussed too openly most of the time in these kinds of talks. Um, so our next thing is talking about different misconceptions about breaking into tech. Do you want to kick us off with that? Sure. So I have a few points. I have a, like a big list of them. Um, I keep on seeing on social media that there are a lot of people who say, oh, breaking into tech is so easy. Like I did it. And there's a big, thing called survivor bias where you're like, yes. because I did it, like other people can do it too. Mm -hmm. And although I agree because yes, I went to the coding bootcamp and I broke into tech, there were many factors that supported me in that process. Like my network, my college education, 
my location. I was in the Bay Area at the time. Uh, the influences around me. So I had, I was able to find a mentor who had been in industry for five years. Uh, so there's a lot of things that supported that. And people are so blind to their privilege sometimes mm -hmm. that they just say breaking into tech is easy. So when people struggle to break into tech, they feel like it's their problem instead of how the industry works. And like you said, getting that first job is the hardest thing. And mm -hmm. Everyone else is thinking there must be something wrong with me because I'm not getting my first opportunity. No, no, no. The industry is like artificially like making it really difficult for people to get entry level jobs. And I just want people to understand that like it's not you. If you don't get that job right away, it's going to be a process and you have to build all of these other pillars to support you along the way. Mm hmm. I'll, I'll actually, I'll push back on that a little. If you are continuing to apply and you don't get the results you want, then you are probably doing something wrong, right? Like I tell people <laughs> yeah, that's who true. come to me and they're like, I've been job searching for six months and I'm not getting anything. First of all, six months is way too damn long. Like you should just be trying something for a month. If it doesn't work out, try a new strategy, get your resume reviewed, get your LinkedIn reviewed, create a portfolio, go into open source. Da, 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 all these different things you can try out. Networking obviously is a big plus. I think there are a lot of more, there are more communities now that like cater to us, which is great. Um, still not enough, but you know, there's some more out there. Um, and I think like a, an untold thing about breaking into tech is that a lot of um, jobs you can get are by referral, right? So it does really help if you know someone at the company you know, for Adobe and Byport, like if you're interested in those, I think Melissa and I would be happy to talk to you more about those. And I think that's where it really helps to have like at least a point of contact to just give you some insight. When I was applying to Slack, I reached out to like 10 different people in Tequeria's Slack community, and most of them did not respond to me. But four of them did, and I had four really good discussions that gave me insight and made me feel more confident going into my interview. I would not have done that like if I had not taken the initiative. And I think that's just like one strategy of many that you can take. But definitely like if you're if you're job searching for too many months, it's not working. You got to change something. So I will say that um, I'll also say another misconception that I personally like had a lot of grief over was data structures and algorithms. So that's historically how technical interviews are done at most tech companies. You do like a pairing session. Or it's just like you figuring it out through like a hacker rank, um, different problems that use really heavy data structures and algorithms. And this is something you would typically learn in like an undergrad CS course. So already you're kind of at a disadvantage if you don't have that. Boot camps caught on though, so they teach that as well. They have dedicated sessions to that. All to say though, uh, for me, like those have never really reflected like the capabilities, right, that you have as a software engineer. Like I never really use those in my day to day work. I am. Uh, it is a bias, though, because I do just like full stack react development. I think someone who's maybe doing something different may be using those more often. So I'll, I'll share that disclaimer. But there are companies that don't uh, use that to interview. So if you're like trying to break into tech you like suck at data structures and algorithms like I did, or you just get a lot of anxiety and you sweat and you're like, oh, but I yeah, but the reverse binary search trees. Like, uh, you know, that's how I was. Like, I always fumbled. I always screwed up somehow or I forgot something. And I was like, can I Google this? Like, that's what I was thinking internally because I would have it like, like this, you know, or just give me 30 minutes and I'll solve this for you. Um, but just like, don't hover over me. And um, there are companies that don't do that. So just like a heads up there, like I had a solid portfolio and that was like something I, I learned the hard way. So cool. Those are some good misconceptions that we broke down, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also a big one, breaking into tech doesn't mean software engineering. There's a lot of other jobs that you could do. Um, so a lot of people think, oh, I need to know how to code to work at a tech company. And that's not true. So figure out what are your strengths and what you like to do and know that working at a tech company uh, can be very fruitful and kind of break those generational disadvantages. Like a lot of us come from low income families, especially as immigrants. So working at a tech company can really be a leg up for your family over the long run. Yeah. 
A hundred percent. I can even give kind of this like real world scenario from someone I, I know. Um, so she was working at Target. She was um, she had a degree in communications. Uh, felt kind of like loss. And I told her, you know, you should look into technical writing. Like that's something that, you know, people get hired for. I didn't know much about technical writing. So I just like helped her like look up some resources and kind of point her that way. Uh, she started doing creating a portfolio of that, blah, blah, ended up getting her first like entry level job. It was at a startup I won't share. Um, but they got like a lot of uh, she got like some decent amount of stock. So she, and then it IPO, right? Game changer, complete game changer, you know, like that's when and like for me that was a game changer too like you join a company it does really really well and that is the key differentiator with tech you know like i just unless it's like finance and you're like at a hedge fund i just don't see like that level of return that can happen for someone who's like a rank and file employee you get just even a little bit of stock and it's worth so much if you get acquired or the company ipos and it's just it's life changing it's it's wealth generation right and this woman was working at Target and like came from like a, a low income background. So those kind of stories are like, this is why I need more of us to be in this industry, specifically this industry. I would love for more of us to be software engineers. That's my that's my bias, uh, <laughs> because I think like yeah. software engineers, that skill can also it'll be easier to do entrepreneurship later. And I want all of us to get to that point. Well, not all of us, but like whoever wants to like can get to that point. They should. Um so that for me is like game changer. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. what were you talking about? I forgot. I like got into that story. Oh, no, we were talking about other paths other than software engineering. Yes, technical writing. Into That's a path. <laughs> technical writing is a path. Uh, let's see. And definitely CS degrees are nice, but not a requirement. Uh, yes. I think that's another misconception is that people think, oh, I don't have a CS degree. The job listing says CS degree, you know, required. And more and more uh, companies are being lax about the wording. So they're saying CS degree or equivalent experience, things like that. Um, so don't let the word CS degree dissuade you from applying. It's like a legalese, right? Like, Companies are also able to hire uh, immigrants, like people with an H-1B visa or some like, mm -hmm. um, occupational visa. So that's why that's there, because people who come through those channels uh, have that requirement. So like, but if you have the ability to work in this country, you are res a resident or um, have your, you're a citizen, uh, then don't really worry about that line, <laughs> I think. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, what I, what was nice about Slack is that they didn't do whiteboarding and a lot of the, um, engineers that I interacted with didn't have that formal CS degree. Uh, on my team, I was the only one who had that formal CS degree and a lot of them, ca uh, carved their own path. Um, they either had like maybe a design background or they did a boot camp, or they did an apprenticeship. Um, Slack actually has like a uh, apprenticeship program called the next chapter, which takes formerly incarcerated folks and teaches them how to code through like the boot camp. Uh, and then they do that year. I think it's a year long or a, like six months uh, of that apprenticeship. And then they convert to full time. Uh, it's a, an amazing program. It is growing. And I think like those kinds of pathways are really nice. And I, I'm for one, I'm a huge advocate specifically of the apprenticeship program, because I think the best way to learn is by doing so. Mm -hmm. um, and that's basically what it is. It's learning by doing, but you're getting paid, which is great. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Do you want to talk I about a couple to... more? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to put a little plug in uh, because I think there's a delay between what we're saying and what people are seeing. So oh, okay. uh, please post some questions in the chat. Uh, and by the time we get to uh, Q&A, we can read them. <laughs> OK, cool. I mean, yeah. I'm not seeing any comments. I'm like, I have it here. Oh. I don't know what you're seeing. Oh. I'm, I'll, I'll look at it. I see it. some comments. Okay. Uh, but they're from like previous things that we had said. So I think we have like a little bit of a time lag. Um, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and let's see. Oh, one big one for me is 
when you're joining a company, your the culture that you're joining is not the company's culture, is that team's culture. So when you're researching uh, like a big company that you want to join, especially, you might think, oh, they have all of these awards for being incredible, for doing this and that. But at the end of the day, uh, you should be gauging the culture that you're joining by the people who interviewed you, mm-hmm. by the conversations yep. you've had with your manager, uh, because that's not necessarily a reflection of the wider culture. And yeah, I think a lot of people sometimes get confused. They're like, oh, I really want to join X company because uh, they're known for X, Y, Z. And then when you show up and you get there, you're, you either are disappointed or like, you know, confused. So yes. it's good to have that distinction mind yes huge huge plus one you could be at the best company like number one rated on glassdoor and forbes and fortune and whatever you know list the listicle um but you could end up on like the crappy team you know that has the really mean manager so yeah you do have to gauge that yourself uh and i think my final one that i have is the big misconception about breaking into tech is that you think everyone's making a lot of money. And that's maybe true in bigger companies, like you might get started at a higher salary point, but for smaller companies, for uh, contracting roles, you might end up making 60,000, you know, as your first role. And I just want people to be um, like emotionally prepared for that um, because that might be the, the fastest way for you to break in and maybe speed is your your goal or maybe you have connections to a bigger company so you can go to a, a larger company and, and make those six figures for your first job but it really depends on your situation and i'm not one who's gonna say you know keep interviewing keep interviewing uh if you have an an offer ready that could like take you out of an unfortunate financial situation right away um so when I was going to my coding bootcamp, I've had some people who had a hard time getting their first offer. Uh, and that meant going further into debt while they're waiting to get a job. And then someone else did a contract yep. role and they weren't earning that much. Yep. Uh, but that then led to better opportunities in the future. So I, I think that that money conversation is very confusing um, and it really depends on where you go and where you are. Yes, I'm going to hone in on that and say, like, um, you do want to make sure you are negotiating, though, because some of these companies do pay a crap ton and you're going to leave a lot of money on the table if you don't negotiate. I think that applies to like later on. I think for your first role, 100 percent OK, if you settle any job is better than no job, in my opinion. And by any job, I do want to preface that with like saying it should be like related to the role that you want. Um, so for example, if you're trying to get into customer support, like if you get like an agent role, that's kind of more low paying, but it's still like very directly related to like that customer support role that you want to get into, um, you can still do that. And then again, it can just be seen as a stepping stone to something better. Uh, I definitely did that early on in my career. I took on a lower paying role. I probably could have like tried harder for a higher paying role at a better company, but I, I intentionally decided to settle because I didn't want to like keep job searching and be not without a job for like more months. So I think it's okay to do that and just be self-aware again, like how much time am I going to spend here? Um, and you can leave a job after six months, you know, like it's okay to do that. If you get stuck, it's like less okay, obviously, because you, then, you know, you're losing that, but uh, cause it has invested, but it's okay. Like if it's really that bad, you can definitely move on to like a better thing. So I love, like, I love that advice. Thank you. And what you're saying about like stock and, and, and all of that, like at the end of the day, you are number one, you need to take care of yourself. So if you're in an environment that's really damaging, uh, you know, you only have one body, you only have one mind. You only have one life. So really take care of yourself. Uh, find that self-care and those habits that are going to take you for the long run because it's a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And I think like, unfortunately, at least in the U.S., we do have like this very 
individualistic society and culture, right? And we have to be self-aware of that, like in the workplace, like how that influences just the societal expectations of how much energy and effort we put into work and not into life balance, right? So I think like more and more people are aware of that. It's like always a conversation on LinkedIn that I like to, to read about. Quiet quitting is like the latest rage now. Um, and yeah, it's important to, to be aware of that. So I think we got through all those misconceptions, right? Yeah, I think we are starting to get some Q&A questions. So oh, let's wrap brilliant. up our quick tips yeah. and then go to those. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's yeah, let's start with you. Quick tips for someone looking to get into <laughs> tech. <laughs> I think one big one is I see people who who just want to copy paste someone else's journey into tech, and I would recommend that you really weigh all your options. You look at what makes you different from everybody else, and look at what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, what are your resources, and then make a decision based on that. Because for me, going to a coding bootcamp was a factor of time. I wanted to pivot very quickly. But for other people, a coding bootcamp might be too expensive, too stressful, um, not the right format for you. Like maybe a college degree might serve you better, like a longer term to, to really get acquainted with the industry and the, and the knowledge. Uh, I ended up getting a CS degree later anyway, mm -hmm. but um, it's it's really about figuring out what works for you instead of uh, just hoping that what someone else did will work for you as well, because we're all different and so are our experiences and, and where we're starting from. So it's kind of unfair to you to not really contextualize yourself. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I think I'll add on to that, like self advocacy is very important. Um, being able to showcase everything that you've done and put effort into. For example, uh, I know this woman who dropped out of her CS degree, she's going to try and like go the apprenticeship route and boot camp route to get into software engineering. Very admirable. And she's very young. So she has like a lot of motivation, a lot of grit. A lot of time and right now she's preparing to job search and um i she has a resume she has linkedin she has a portfolio i looked at all of that and there's nothing personal about her anywhere there's no story so to your point like mm. i want to see the uniqueness what what do you bring to the table because it was just like she was just showcasing her technical skills and it's like well i don't know what you want out of a company i don't know what you're passionate about um and maybe to a recruiter, like all they care about is like the, the skills, but also she still doesn't have a lot of practical experience yet either. So I think if like I'm trying to give advice to someone who's trying to break into tech, they have learned the technical skills from some source, whether it's online by themselves, a coding boot camp, some other learning program. Make sure to think about like what it is you want to apply those skills to, right? Like let's say you're passionate about climate change or the environment. You can completely, totally apply that software engineering skills to help a climate focused business, a local business. You can use that to help a nonprofit with their technology stack, their website. There are so many like practical ways to apply those skills and align it with what you're passionate about. And that in and of itself is like showing a unique story that you can share with the world and will just make you more appealing, right? Because then the recruiter can really get a sense of like, oh, wow, yeah, I completely understand what this person wants and what they offer and what they value, like what they can offer and value to um, the company. So that's my, yeah. my two cents. Yeah. That was awesome. And it just made me think about how the bar keeps moving over time. Yeah. Like before a long time ago, a, a high school degree was enough to stand out. Then a bachelor's degree became the bar, then a master's degree, you know, and there are so many other ways to set yourself apart that don't have to be getting a degree, uh, but get creative. Like, I think it's really important to, yes. to really showcase what you value about yourself so that other people can see the value in you. Like, if you don't see it, how will anybody else? Right? Yes. 
A hundred percent. And you can align those with your passions. Like you can do things that you enjoy doing and use your skills to do them. So that that's important. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's do a Q and a, I don't know where these questions are. <laughs> I'm like looking at the same page you're looking at. Um, I'll, I'll try to refresh. And then I saw some oh, new ones. I uh, oh my gosh. That's what it is. Okay. Oh Lord. <laughs> okay. So I have one here. Okay. Uh, Isaac Maya says, apart from these events, what advice would you give to leverage LinkedIn to help us work in tech? Apart from these events, how to leverage LinkedIn? LinkedIn is mm -hmm. like humongous, right? So you kind of have to narrow down the field. And I think the easiest way to narrow down the field on LinkedIn is either to do intentional like one-on-one -on -one reach outs, like and asking someone out to coffee and being like very uh, grateful and being very generous up front about their time. So for example, like let's say I want to work at Asana and I find a software engineer who works in the same team that I want to work on. Uh, I do a outbound to her and I ask her like, hey, I would love to talk to you about your experience at Asana. I saw that you are in the LA area uh, you want to, I can treat you to like dinner or coffee or something. And bam, I have like a ton of insight that I'm going to get from that conversation. So I think with LinkedIn, you kind of have to be more intentional. It's like a lot harder to like network in the same way you would organically at an in-person event, but you can use LinkedIn to find those in-person events, right. And find those like in-person connections. So I, I'll say that about LinkedIn communities are also really useful and you can find those on LinkedIn jobs there's a plethora and i think like with the jobs i haven't found a job like through linkedin personally i know a lot of people who have though and i think like they're just intentional about researching like the team and everything on linkedin because there's so much of that information on there uh and like connecting with the recruiter better too because they all that information is available there as well in the job but yeah linkedin is a powerful tool i don't think it's it's not it should not be the only tool that you use though for sure definitely i think one big way that i've used linkedin is in building personal brand so when a potential employer is looking for something uh, they will find you more readily if there's more content that you've generated uh, more advice more positive energy that you're putting out in the universe um and also I, I'm a big ad advocate of working smarter, not harder. So on LinkedIn, you can reach out to people one-on-one, -on -one, but if you have a powerful network, you can post something like, hey, I'm looking for a role in this and people will come to you. So it's, it's all connected, you know, like work, like the work that you put in today to build yourself, build your brand, build your presence is going to pay dividends in the future. And also the connections you make, like, like Francis was saying, you could meet one-on-one -on -one with somebody and maybe today they're a junior engineer, but maybe in like five years, in 10 years, they could be a, like a director or a, or a manager for a team you want to join. So it's really important to not um, look at the connections that you're making today in a transactional way, in a, will this person bring me value and more as how can we support each other along this journey? Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, uh, I think think someone had a question about like entering the tech industry as like a quality assurance person, like qual QA. Uh, what do you suggest mm -hmm. to do if you have a bachelor's? I was just kind of noodling about that as you were talking because the the idea of like showcasing your personal brand on LinkedIn is, is effective, but then you have that, that idea of like, Oh, I'm looking for a job. Most people can't say that they're looking for a job because then their job will be like, uh, I just saw this LinkedIn post. You're looking for a job <laughs> now. Um, so what I, I would suggest maybe is like showcasing your, what you're working on more so, but also if you are actively looking like you can do that as well and like promote yourself more easily, like you could say, here's a job that I did. Like, here's a, a, a like a, a project that I did with QA and like here you can hire me like I'm actively looking for a job, you know, like message me or something. But I, I want to like go back to your question, Gladys, like what do you suggest to do if you have a bachelor's? I don't know. I, I can look at your LinkedIn and try to glean like what your QA skills are and like kind of far, how far along you are. But you do have to kind of get that base like skill set right as a QA 
um, engineer. And you can either do that through like an apprenticeship program if they have that. I don't personally know it of any off the top of my head. Um, or you try to look for an entry level role like in quality assurance and, and do that. Um, but more so, I would say like if you haven't created those foundational skills yet, to do that through like a boot camp or an online course. I know of several like online courses that definitely specialize in quality assurance. So definitely doing that. Having a bachelor's like is just the base minimum, I think like Melissa said, uh, honestly, like it's the base minimum. So many people are going to have a bachelor's. If it's in a STEM related field, I think that will help. Or if it's related to like the company like you're working, you wanna work for. So say like quality assurance engineer Alan, I'll use this example again at like a climate change focused company and you have a bachelor's in environmental studies, that's relevant. You know, like there's a connection there um, and they're, they're going to be like more keen on you, I think. So that's my two cents on that. Like definitely set up your foundational skills and then try and get an entry level role like that way through your network. Yeah. yeah Melissa, do you want to And one more thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more thing I would add is my brother is also interested in this career track, and he recently told me that there's certifications you can get for specifically QAing. Uh, that would also help you set uh, set yourself apart to take a, mm, a, yes. a test and get certified. Uh, because a lot of people, I think, kind of enter this industry like through contract work or, or you know, kind of falling into the role. Uh, but if you want to be very intentional about it, uh, build your your arsenal, your tool sets. Do you want to tackle um, another can, question from the audience? We have one more. Okay. Uh, oh, I, I will refresh after I see this one. <laughs> uh, this is from Janessa Tran. She says, there are many different paths to take as a software engineer. Oh, yeah. How did you two find your niche and develop it? What advice do you have for folks who are interested in a specific path in tech, but don't have those opportunities in their current role? That's a really good question. Uh, Ooh. it's also something I thought about a lot when I entered tech. It's funny because the question kind of implies that I chose this. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it kind of like, like I, I talked about falling into roles and, and you kind of like my first job in tech wasn't software engineering. It was, uh, trust and safety yes. and content moderation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then all everything afterwards i was kind of interested in that and there you know there is going to school and getting exposed to a breadth of things and be like oh i find this interesting and that interesting there's also self-exploration where you do toy projects on your spare time and you're like oh i really love this tooling i love this concept and then you go in that direction and then finally there's going with the flow <laughs> like you, you you get into this role and you're like i like doing it and you continue doing it. Um, however, if you find that you don't like it, you're like, oh, I, I do it because I get paid to do it versus I derive a lot of pleasure and fulfillment from the work, then I would recommend going back to school or um, exploring other things, talking to other engineers who do different things and asking them, what does your day-to-day -day look like? What skills do I need to develop to do that work? And do you know of anyone who may be hiring for these roles that I could like pivot into? Uh, working at a bigger company, so Janessa joined me at Adobe, uh, it's a little bit easier to do this pivoting because you already have um, your reputation and your brand internally, yep. Yep. and that can help your manager help help you pivot into a different role in the company. Yeah, I yeah, I'm gonna piggyback off that. Like you work at Adobe, Janessa. Adobe's like Oh, you know, it's like one of those companies people dream of going and being at. And like, if you're not uh, finding the opportunities in your current role, like ask your manager, hey, I want to go into this path. Like, if you feel comfortable enough with your manager to ask them that, like, they'll probably be able to help you pivot internally. Like, it is better to pivot internally, I think, and get that experience. And then you can always like leave and go to another company and like be in a higher position in that pathway that you're trying to pursue. Like that's a very tangible way of kind of thinking about it. Um, in terms of finding niche, uh, niche, I feel like I at some point was um, focusing not enough on my engineering career because I was doing all this stuff that was trying to like elevate people like myself 
and like basically increase diversity in tech, like through all the nonprofit volunteering I was doing and, 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 and speaking and stuff. And I think at some point I had to like, kind of just embrace the fact that I'm always going to feel this obligation to pay it forward. And my partner, who's like a cis white guy, he was like in the background earlier, he's not going to ever feel that obligation. Like he's going to be an ally and he is a good ally. He, he supports me, but he's not going to feel that obligation to like do more for his community like I do. Like it's just not the same. And I think like for me, my niche is elevating Latinx professionals in tech because I want more people like myself to be in roles of leadership. I don't know that I really like had a choice in that per se. It just... I think it, I did have a choice in that I am intentionally devoting a lot of time to it that I don't have to necessarily, but I want to. Um, and there is a sacrifice to that, of course. There, there, There is. There will always be a sacrifice if you're trying to do more and pay it forward to your community in some way. But there doesn't have to be. It just like usually is early on. So at least in my experience. But um, yeah. Melissa, any other questions? I think I, I thought I saw one other one. I think we, I didn't see any more on my end. Let me ref uh, let me refresh. Mm, yeah, okay. I guess not. <laughs> yeah. um, so I did want to talk about yeah. two things, uh, since we don't have any more questions. Yeah. One of them being uh, how to take care of your mental health. Yes. And the mm -hmm. other one kind of related is how do we dismantle the internal trauma um, of, you know, struggling? Mm -hmm. So we like you said, you have this sense of duty to to your family, to to your community. And this can be very heavy, uh, a burden to bear. And things like taking time off and things like uh, stepping away from from work for life and things like that are very challenging for people like us. So how do you balance that, Francis? Um, you know, I'm still learning. Like I am, I, I am very self-aware that I'm like a recovering workaholic. Like I was working 60 to 80 hour weeks at some point, um, which is insane, you know, but that's literally what it was. It was like 65. I calculated it at one point and it was 65. And then on one week, I think it like got close to 80, but it was basically like every working, every waking moment in my life, I was dedicating to not myself. It was just something that was not me. It was either work or it was like volunteering or it was a nonprofit or it was like, you know, trying to inspire other people. Like it was just not my physical or mental health, basically. And so that I, I totally burned out during the pandemic. And I think what it was May of this year that... I sort of stepped down from like all my involvement and in, like volunteering stuff and decided to like, again, focus more on like me and my engineering career more so. And so then I had all this free time and I learned to use that free time to, again, just focus on me, like me and my dogs. My dogs make me really happy. So I'm like just spending more time with them. They're really good at agility now. Uh, I have like an agility <laughs> course outside in my front yard that I practice with them like almost every day. And kind of just like retraining my brain to deprioritize things that should de be deprioritized. Um, and I just didn't really know how to do that. I was just like, for the like first initial couple of years of my career, just hustling and grinding. Because uh, I felt like that's, that's all I could do to like keep up, you know, and not fall behind, really. Uh, and there is this like, really competitive atmosphere, I think, within software engineering. I don't know if you've ever been on Blind. Blind is like super toxic as an app. I don't <laughs> um, but have you heard of Blind? You've, you've yep. been on? Okay, yeah. It's yeah, I've been on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just like people complaining like, oh, yeah, I'm like at Google and yeah, I've been here for like a year and I'm only making like 170 and uh, I don't know, I think I should like leave or something, blah, blah. It's just like all this crazy level of entitlement and I just like cannot relate to it. And it's just like, and that's how I have, I like, that's how I perceive the industry though sometimes. Like just this like level of entitlement and arrogance and privilege that 
is so far beyond like what I even have like on a day to day basis, you know, like I just can't even think like that. So, um, yeah, just kind of like, oh my gosh, I forgot the initial question, but yeah, mental health, super <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I think like it's also really yeah. hard because as women and as uh, Latinas, like yeah. sometimes we question: Are we not asking enough of the pie? Right? Yeah. Like, are That's we right. um, putting ourselves down in relation? So when I I hear you talk about blind and how people are like very, very entitled, sometimes is it are we not entitled enough? That's right. right. That's right. And I, I wonder I how that affects other people who are entering after us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I mean, like, I think to like shame myself, I will check and like doom scroll on the app and be like, oh my God, I need to like, oh, I need to do more. (laughs) Um, And and, like, oh my God. And the money is insane too. Like I won't, I won't pretend like money isn't important to me because like it, it is. And um, it, yeah, it's, there's so much money in this industry. And even in my first job, I was already starting to make more than both of my parents' salaries combined. And it was just like daunting. And it wasn't something I could be like, Hey, parents, like help me, help me deal with this, like feeling of weirdness that I'm getting from like earning more money than you. Like, even that is just kind of a weird thing, you know? I don't know what to call it. I feel like there's a term for that feeling that should be created where you just like have that feeling like (laughs) the Germans probably have something (laughs) I'm earning more than both my parents like oh and I feel guilty about it but also like oh god like uh, you know I need to be earning more there are people out there earning more than me yeah that's where the guilt comes in right and the overworking you're like I'm earning x amount of time and the people I know who are earning less money are working crazy hours to earn even a fraction of it. So you, you almost feel this sense of, um, and it's not an impetal, uh, you feel an obligation to work long hours. The obligation is on salaries. You're like, it's unlimited hours. Right. And I wanted to touch base on like, I recently had to take some time off from work because I got really overwhelmed and stressed out. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for people to, to realize that rest and relaxation and decompression is part of productivity and it's part of your job as a person. Like you need to take care of yourself because nobody else is going to tell you, Hey, hey, take a break because they don't see what's going on inside of you. Um, and I think that's really important. And especially because we don't know how to rest or parents didn't teach us how to rest. Like my dad worked so many jobs and anytime I saw him, he was just taking a nap and then going back to work. And that's not the same thing as resting. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of us have so much to unlearn because even though we have so much respect and and value our parents and all of their sacrifices, like we don't have to work ourselves to death. Yeah. But also like when American, we're here. American capitalism like wants us oh, yeah. to work to death. So it's just like, <laughs> gotta unlearn that too or just gotta be like yep mm-hmm. yeah yeah that that's a thing so i i've always like known i think that part of why i work so hard is because my both my parents were like also workaholics at some point they are both like much older than i am right and like are having to unlearn that as well for themselves like my mom so like just did so much and she was also a mom of three you know and like she did get support like from my dad but she is still a lot it's like too much you know that women have to do and I saw that and I was like it made me feel like man I, I can I do that like I don't know if I could handle that you know like having kids and working at the same time because she was doing that for a little bit um and then she had to take a break from it too right and it's just like yeah I don't know. Uh, they they are also Someone like learning to be more chill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was asking about this uh, to the women at Adobe channel. I was uh-huh. like, hey, like, how do you balance being a mom and, and thriving in your career? Uh-huh. And I don't remember who said this, but it was so poignant. She said, you can have everything, just not all at once. 
And I think that just kind of summarizes like the, the, the approach we need to take in our careers is mm-hmm. like invest this time towards this and then the next time towards something else. And over time, you'll get to where you need to go, but you won't be doing it all in a compressed way and, and getting overwhelmed and like getting on, like sacrificing your health. Right. And I thought that was really insightful. Like we can have everything we want, just not right now. <laughs> like not all at once. But then I'm like, why can't I have everything? <laughs> well, men, maybe you're an outlier. Everything. The men can have everything. Why can't I have everything? But yeah, no, you're, yeah. You're I don't think, right. I don't think the men have everything. Like there's a reason that men also have health, uh, mental health issues in our society. Like, um, and then as we grow, like we just talked about our fathers not having the time to have affection and yeah. share um, our relationships. That's the trade off, you know? Yeah. No, you're right. I, like there's this guy I follow on LinkedIn. His name's Scott Galloway. And a lot of his content is around like young men needing more support in our society because of the way like they repress a lot they have they're not doing as well in school like more women are graduating from college than men or like it mm-hmm. is that already or will be very soon and i feel like for me i i agree to some extent like we just need to be supporting younger people in general but like there's already so much baked in institutional sexism that even someone yeah like a woman who is supported really well versus like a man who's not supported because of that institutional sexism, even the underprepared man is going to get like more chances and more opportunities to fail than the woman is like, that's just how our society is like not kind to women, you know, like, especially women in leadership. Like I see that a lot. And I have seen that like in the workplace, like how women, they have to do things correct or they're just, it's just, no, they're not going to be trusted anymore. Or they're seen as really mean because they're just more confrontational mm-hmm. and like more like low context, right. In terms of their communication. So yeah. Um, it, it's, what I'm it's, hearing yeah. from you is we all need the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Like we, we all need these things to be, entrenched in every facet of society and we need to look with compassion and kindness and and listen to each other and support each other um yeah because i think everyone's struggling (laughs) like what are we doing (laughs) no that's Um, that's what i want yeah Yeah, that's exactly what i want and that's my secret is like that's why i'm doing all these things i'm doing because i want more of us to make those decisions at the top. And the only way we can do that is if we first enter as individual contributors, be in the industry for a while, and then get to that level where we have that influence and can just change things like the standard basically, right? So, yeah. yeah. This was- And I'm glad we have each other. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. To remind ourselves (laughs) along the way. Yeah, well, this was an awesome discussion. I had a headache this morning. It's gone. It's completely gone. Like this was such a good discussion. It was lovely to chat with you about a lot of heavy topics, like more so than I thought there would be, but it was awesome actually. Like I think this kind of shows sort of the uniqueness of like our position and our roles and like what we bring to the table, like personal and and non-personal. So yeah, any closing thoughts, anything you wanna share? Um, This will be recorded. So, you know, people will be able to tune in after, Um, yeah. I am just really grateful. Um, I think it's like, like what you said, that we were able to delve into these deeper topics and it's because of our Latinidad, like we value openness and sharing. And, and even though we've never met in person, I I think we may have met one time. No, yeah, we met once. Yeah. (laughs) You feel like family, you know, like, like our community has this, um, sense of community and, and, and family and ties and, and we are here for each other. And I hope that everyone listening in today also feels that from us, that we're here for you, that you're supported and that whatever you decide your dreams are, that it's possible and that there are people out there who are willing to help. 
Yes, plus one, especially to the there are people out there willing to help. You just need to be able to ask. You just have to ask. You have to take that initiative. But there are people who want to help. Uh, also learn how to ask the right way, though. You know, don't just be like, help me, you know, or like, give me all your time. I need all the advice I can get. Like there is a, you know, a nice way to ask for things. Um, yes, that's my last tip. But um, yeah, this was an awesome discussion, Melissa. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. And yeah, that'll be it. Cheers. Okay. Bye.